Hello and welcome to this video discussing the uh, Syrian situation uh, during fall of 2018. Here we are in the fall of 2018, although if you come to Louisiana, it will feel like summer. I'm drinking the rest of this uh, Tecate light, not a very good light beer really. I think when I initially reviewed it, it was a C, that was years ago. And I thought, well, it's not so bad. It's better than I thought. But upon further review, yeah, it really is a C. Uh, Mexican beer, I'm favorable towards Mexican beer, but I don't think light beer is their strong suit at all. American companies do a good job with light beer. Not that I'm a light beer person. I don't buy it. This was in a variety pack. I don't generally buy it. Sometimes I'll buy it, but for review purposes. Otherwise, let's get off of that. Talk about the serious situation. You might have seen the recent news that the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin's Russia, is going to send three, about three S-300 uh, surface-to-air missile batteries to Syria, put them along the coast and along the Israeli border. And then initially, I mean, and then eventually, I mean to say, eventually up to eight batteries, they're saying. Who will man the batteries, I guess, Syria, once they're trained, the Syrians, with maybe Russian advisors, it may be Russians the whole time, just with uh, under a under official Syrian control. You know what I mean? Well, it's a big uproar. Um, Israel is very angry. They were speaking two ways, though, saying, oh, it's terrible. You shouldn't do it. But we've been planning. Then they said, we've been planning for this for 20 years. We will know how to respond. And they said that these the missiles have arranged to go in inside of Israel to shoot down planes. And this follows the incident where the Syrian military accidentally shot down a Russian transport plane. And the Russians said the Israelis caused it because one of their fighters jet, jets was using the the Russian transports, um, sort of like code, radar code, and it's heat to mask itself. And then um, the Syrians shooting at the Israeli plane and did not mean to shoot down the Russian plane. Now the United States is saying it's a bad idea and they're telling Russia not to do it. So you say, well, what? Your channel is anti-war. What does that have to do with anti-war? Okay, well, it has a lot to do with it because remember, you you might say, well, what is, what do you think the U.S. positions should be? You know, my other channel, once a month, I do political, government, history topics. This channel is like an overflow channel and gives me a chance to do more more of it without people getting sick of it, probably. Um, well, you have to. Understand our position, the anti-war group, you say you're one of those anti-war people, aren't you? Yes. Our position is, look, the United States shouldn't be involved in the Arab-Israeli conflict to start with, the Syrian Arab Republic versus Israel. You say, and I like to use point, counterpoint in these, you know that. You say, well, you're, not, you're saying the U.S. should not support Israel? We're saying, no, the United States should not support Israel. On the other hand, the United States government should not be supporting Syria. We should not be for or against Russia, just friendly with every country, neutral with all countries. And what should we be doing with other countries willing to interact and make fair trade deals, bilateral trade agreements? If it's possible, like say this to Russia, we'll sell you our products, you sell us your products. Now, if you have high tariffs on our products, unfortunately, we will have to put high tariffs on your products at par with what you're doing now. If you don't like it, that's too bad. But the old, you know, that's what Trump is saying. The old way is an unfair arrangement where you get American goods and you place a high tariff so that Russians will buy Russian products instead. Then you want to dump your products on America at low tariffs. But really that's concerns China more than Russia in that case. But I'm just using that as an example, a hypothetical example. So um, the United States, however, under the 
Obama administration sent troops into Syria. Now, what do you call it when a country sends their troops into another country without the country's permission? That would be an invasion, right? And an invasion is an act of war, right? So if we want to be accurate, I think to be fair, we would have to say that the Barack Hussein Obama administration made war against Syria, not formal. They didn't go to Congress and ask for a declaration of war. The United States hasn't done that since 1941, declared war on anybody. But they make war. The United States makes war on countries. And by financing rebel groups to try to overthrow the government of Syria, there's no other answer but the U.S. made war on Syria. Russia ran to their help, to their aid. Russia is a well-known, even under the Soviet Union days, even more so than maybe a Syrian ally. Russia's overseas naval bases in Syria. Okay. Um, you say, oh, you're one of those anti-Obama people, one of those Trump people. Well, to be fair, here's Donald Trump over a year, going on two years into his administration. American troops are still in Syria. United States has attacked Syria under Trump. Those might have been staged uh, sort of a uh, play acting attacks, you see, to placate the um, left wing media, left wing pol political groups and neoconservative political groups, which really is a left wing approach to uh, government. Most people don't know anything about neoconservatism, so they think it's, it is conservative when it is not. And we're not going to get into Trotskyite uh, conspiratorial activity or revolutionary would be more accurate to say revolutionary activity because conspiratorial would be in, in secret but they openly have done this since the 1950s so but um yes so here's trump and he said it's going to be a whole new program or a whole new approach we haven't really seen that he may have attempted to do it but he's under a lot of pressure from the neoconservatives and the, and the left-wing groups in conjunction with you know, the establishment, if you want to call it that, which is what it is today. To not have peace with Russia, of course, and to continue to be the world police, which we've talked against on this channel. Um, so, yeah, there's no doubt if you're going to say it's a new day, things are going to change, it's a new world under Trump, well, then there has to be evidence of that. Now, he has to walk a fine line. It's very difficult for him because his own party is out to get him to a large extent. Because to remember that we've talked about this in the past on the other channel, the Republican Party is sort of locked in, a, in an internal struggle or a civil war within themselves. The establishment, Republicans, <laughs> sending me a notice notification on Google Hangouts. I wish it wouldn't chime. I got a set it where it doesn't chime. But um, I've got other settings on other things where they don't chime. But um, you have the, what you would say, the old right conservatives in the Republican Party. That's a small percentage of the party, okay? They have that old traditional non-interventionist, you know, the America first neutrality, uh, Opposed those uh, trade organizations. They want bilateral trade agreements. Would be against the United Nations organization and all these uh, entangling alliances you see. But that's not. They're not in control of the party. Trump is not in control of the party. Although the party was very shook up that he won. You see, even though they tried to sabotage his campaign. So um, he's got. A, he's not. in full control and doesn't have much control. It could turn out eventually that he does. It's, I don't know how likely that is. So perhaps he wants to get the troops out 
and he doesn't feel like he needs he could afford to go for broke and just pull him out i don't know it seemed like if he's that much of a risk taker and everything like he says he would just get him out of there and say i don't care if these people get angry they're coming out you see the new day is really a new day and all that business so but i, I we're not seeing a whole lot of difference with, with the trump opposed to as opposed to obama or bush too or Clinton or Bush number one, because it was the same old story of uh, deciding that the US needed to have troops in Syria, the US needed to tell Iran what to do and be very militaristic against Iran and Iraq on behalf of Tel Aviv, Jerusalem. And so, it remains to be seen if there really will ever be any real change. Back in 2015, Trump talked good, saying, remember on CBS News, on 60 Minutes, we're gonna be neutral in the Arab-Israeli conflict. I knew then he would catch all kinds of uh, flack from that, and there would really be forces arrayed against him. I noticed before he made the statement, the media mostly just laughed at him as sort of a joke. And I don't think they were really too concerned about him. They just really looked at him as sort of a, a sideshow, a joke, uh, not to be taken seriously. Maybe I misread that. But after he made the statement that the U.S., if he became president, the U.S. was going to be neutral in the Arab-Israeli conflict, then it's just like a switch went on overnight, this great uprising against Trump, the campaign. But then at the same time, there was a big upsurge in support for him from most of your more right-wing oriented organizations. And I monitored them and they were saying, oh, you know, hey, it's the first time, here's a candidate who's not uh, in, you know, under in, undue influence from foreign elements. Uh, and it's comical today, because now we have the people saying the Russian influence, but, uh, and that he wants to have neutrality in the Arab-Israeli conflict and all of this. It's never happened, going back to Truman and all of this. So I said, yeah, that could be a big problem. And then he also talked about he wanted to make friends with Russia, which is a no-no when it comes to the United States establishment. We've talked about that in the past, haven't we? And that's a long video, which we're not gonna do today. You're, wel you're welcome to comment. Anybody who's watching is welcome to comment and even join the discussion face to face if you want to get into it. But um, I've said that for years. But um, that goes back to 1815. You say that's 200, that's 203 years ago. But literally since 1815, the British Empire has been the British royal, the crown would be more accurate today to British crown. This is not really an empire today, so to speak, so much as it is a, a commonwealth, a royal commonwealth, but it's the same old story. In league against Russia, to bring down Russia, with a, a short hiatus from that between 1914 and 1918, and then another short hiatus between 1941 and 1944 for because they, they had another fish to fry, right? But aside from that interruption period, well, I said 1914 to 1918, more like 1899 to 1918. But um, aside from that interruption, it's been a, a full bore anti-Russian campaign on behalf of London and New York, or technically the capital of the United States is Washington, right? So once world war ii was coming to an end in 1944 then the, the 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 junior partner of this axis the washington london axis took up the, the the torch or kind of picked up the mantle of leading the charge because of the, the 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 parent you know the mother country being elderly and not as strong in the past being elderly still setting the policy to a large extent but being elderly, not being able to have the strength to lead the charge, but the United States, so maybe before 1944, it was the British American axis. And now since 1944, it's been the American British axis, right? 
were leading the charge against the Soviet Union and now the Russian Federation. There was a chance in 1992 to change all that when the Soviet Union collapsed. And I was thinking that 27, 27 years ago, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, 27, 26 years ago, 27, tw yeah, okay, December, it'll be 27 years ago, I was thinking, uh, well, here's our chance, our real chance to have a reasonable amount of peace in the world. But then very quickly with George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, Bush number one, I realized, no, they don't want to make peace with Russia. They're going to kick a man when he's down. And then Clinton did the same thing. And then uh, Bush, Bush number two, and then Obama, very anti-Russia, Obama and uh, his, uh, the, or perhaps even the real president, Clinton, Hillary Clinton, uh, being very, very, very antagonistic toward Russia. And then launching wars against Libya, Syria, Egypt, and all of this, so Yemen. So uh, we want to see some change. We want to see some change. So the whole point is, what should be the United States' response to Russia putting missiles in Syria? Well, from the anti-war viewpoint, there should be no response. Or, in fact, no interest, no involvement. We're saying the United States should be neutral in fact as well as in deed. Neutral in fact as well as in deed. Neutral in the mind, by the policy, and in practice. Now, Woodrow Wilson said that, but he didn't believe it. America should be neutral in fact as well as in deed. But, but we do believe it. We're not just saying that to uh, help ourselves get reelected. We're not saying he kept us out of war, kept past tense which if you read between the lines, doesn't mean will keep us out of war. We're saying no, the United States should not be antagonistic toward the Syrian Arab, Arab Republic. The United States should not be antagonistic towards the Russian Federation. The United States should not be antagonistic toward Iran. You say, well, Iran is building nuclear weapons. Well, that's the allegation. They said they build a nuclear technology for electrical power supply for the country. You say, well, they might bomb Israel with a nuclear bomb. More than likely, they would be bombed by Israel with a nuclear bomb. Re regardless, that is not, we're saying from the right, the old fashioned right wing, I guess you want to call it, paleo conservative, old right viewpoint, classical liberal, really. Edmund Burke, you know, the old liberal. But uh, it really doesn't matter. That's an Arab. That's a, a Persian-Israeli dispute. And if the US wasn't involved in it, it probably would be worked out. They wouldn't, uh, Israel could not afford to be so tough, heavy-handed and tough talking and aggressive without their sponsor, right? If we're not sponsoring them to a tune of billions of dollars of handout welfare, you see conservatives say they're against welfare, but then in practice, they're not against welfare, because here's a perfect example. Uh, foreign aid is well a form of welfare, you see. So uh, if that wasn't going on, they might have to really be a nicer player in the Near East, a nicer neighbor, a more friendly neighbor, because they would, who is going to help them get out of this pickle they would get themselves in? They wouldn't have Uncle Sugar out there giving them all this freebie stuff and run into their aid and facilitating it. See what I'm saying? You you understand. They would have to make a deal. But no, Uncle Sugar, Uncle Slugger, <laughs> Uncle Slugger, has been involved with this since May 14, 1948. Play, taking sides in these conflicts, and then you say, oh, I don't understand why these people attack us. And then the people on the news say, Oh, they, they bomb us because we're free and they hate democracy. But then when you read the propaganda of the people that attack the United States, they never say that. They never say, we don't like America because they're free. <laughs> we don't like America because they have democracy. If you read these people's propaganda, they are indifferent to America's former government. They don't have a much regard for American culture because they see it as a nasty culture, you see, but they're indifferent to America's former government. They have no interest in it. If you read their propaganda, they say, no, we attack 
it's a counterattack because the Americans take sides in these Arab-Israeli conflicts, and America puts troops in Iraq, America puts troops in Saudi Arabia, and Yemen, and Iran, well, they would like to in Iran, Syria, so on. And they say, we're fighting, our back, fighting back against a bully. So I remember in uh, September and October of 2001, they say, oh, we, we were attacked because we're free, because they hate our freedom. But that isn't what they said. I read all that stuff. They said, no, it's because the U.S. has troops in Saudi Arabia and takes sides in the Arab-Israeli conflict. So you got to look at what the enemy says, not what propagandists that are trying to trump up a war say. You, you understand? Like the news, CNN, Fox, the White House, they'll always find an excuse for a war and they're going to frame it in a, in a good way. It's going to make it sound good. This is a war to end all wars. This is a war to make the world safe for democracy. This is a war against uh, hatred and racism and intolerance and totalitarianism, even though we're helping a totalitarian country based in Moscow fight another totalitarian country based in Berlin, one mass murdering country fight another mass murdering country. See, but they don't frame it in those terms. It doesn't sound good. Or this is a war against international communism to, to stop the spread of communism, right? We have to, uh, we have to fight against the domino effect, right? If one, if one domino falls, then all the dominoes fall. And that's that same theory. Let me go get some water. I'll be right back to finish talking. So if you read all the pro-war, the pro-interventionist propaganda, they say the same thing all the time and they expect no one to think or to uh, give a counterpoint. Oh, they say, a threat against freedom anywhere is a threat against freedom everywhere. <laughs> You've heard that speech where that guy, that guy from uh, Atlanta said that something along those lines, it might be an exact quote, a threat, a threat against freedom anywhere is a threat against freedom everywhere. In other words, if some little town in some obscure county in Alabama so-called violates people's freedom, it's a threat to your freedom in some county in Vermont. How that would be, you would have to try to wonder how that could actually be the case. But it's the same thing, like the domino effect, like, uh, Somehow that's going to come to Vermont, you see. <laughs> it's going to affect Vermont some kind of detached way. And it's that same idea. If uh, if the Khmer Rouge takes over Cambodia, if those Khmer Rouge march down the street in Phnom Penh and Batam Bang, why, soon they'll be marching down Los Angeles, uh, Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles and, and, and Broadway in St. Louis, and Fifth Avenue in New York City. And people don't think why most Americans probably don't even know where Syria is on a map, I'm afraid. So they say, oh yeah, we have to stop that. If Vietnam falls, we're next. And now you say, well, why would people believe that? Well, you see, but that's how they were raised, you see. Because during World War II, that's the propaganda that the, my grandparents were told and great grandparents, so that's the whole mindset. If Belgium falls, and if France falls, then we'll be next, <laughs> you see? What that means translated into regular English is, the president is trying to get you involved in a war so that your children could go fight the war over there in Europe to shoot at people that they don't know and have no personal conflict against, you see? And, or if South Korea falls, then, uh, you know, Oregon is next. You see that, you know, the North Korean army and with their great Navy is going to come across the ocean and next the Chinese, the red Chinese, the red Chinese and the North Koreans are going to land and march through Portland, Oregon. And people fall for that and they say, oh, no. And if I, if, if the, 
if the Syrian government is allowed to gas its people, which if you study that story is highly likely that highly unlikely that it ever really happened. Why? It'll be here or something, you know. Uh, next thing, they'll be gassing us in uh, at Macy's <laughs> or uh, at uh, Target. Now, in the Great Russian Empire, the Great Russian threat. They hack our elections. They made people vote for Trump. People were under their robotic control to vote for Trump. <laughs> and um, the great Russian Navy and the great Russian Army and the great Russian Air Force is going to invade Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania and Poland and Ukraine and, and Moldova and uh, Romania and Bulgaria and Hungary and Germany and France and Belgium and England and Scotland and Virginia and Maryland and Kentucky and Arkansas. You see, they'll never stop in Missouri. And people, they believe these things, these fantasies. So think about all the wars America has fought all based on fantasies. say you're just disrespecting the veterans they fought for freedom no i think in their minds that's what they thought they were fighting for you see i agree they thought they were fighting for freedom but we know in reality they were fighting for an empire projection of imperialism greed um and all these things but that doesn't sound good who wants to say my grandfather died my grandfather died fighting for international finance uh that doesn't really that isn't going to sound too good in a in a fourth of july parade or veterans day parade on november 11th my grandfather my grandpa my grandpa he died fighting for international finance capitalism <laughs> you might think your grandpa got a bad deal in that okay now some Americans going to get killed in Syria. Oh, they died keeping us free. I love when they say that on TV. I don't love it, but I find it comical, you know. Those people over there are dying to keep you free. And I always ask the question, how does attacking some obscure province in Afghanistan, Afghanistan keep me free? I don't recall Afghanistan having any kind of great army. They're landlocked. They don't even have a navy. What are they going to do, parachute into the United States? That's a country that has no internal unity, you understand? They had a central government that had no control over the country, even up until 1973 when their king was overthrown by Russian-supported rebels, okay? So then, okay, same old story. Russia tried to make Afghanistan a, a Russian satellite, a Soviet satellite nation. They had been trying to do that since the 1800s during the Great Game. We know it as the Great Game with the British. The British from India were trying to make Afghanistan a, a British satellite nation in their sphere of influence. Only problem is uh, Afghanistan and is in between Russia and at that time, British India. India is still part of the British Commonwealth, the Commonwealth of Nations. Sorry, don't use that term British. Pay no mind to that. Who is the head of the Commonwealth of Nations? Oh, Queen Elizabeth. Pay no mind to that name behind the curtain. Now, you say, but India is a republic with a president. I know that. <laughs> They've been a republic since 1950. I'm, a, I'm well aware that India has had her own president since 1950. And Syria, uh, Pakistan since 1956. I'm telling you about Afghanistan. So that you got Americans over there in Afghanistan today, marching around, getting killed, killing people, getting killed. They bombing the school, the school above. Somebody said something. Been going on. Really, it's been a continuous war since 1973. Let's be honest. But you see, the Russians never could take over Afghanistan because the Western world, meaning the British and American, you know, construct, sent in. Uh, aid to help the rebels against the Russians in 1973, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79. And then what happened in December 79? The Russian supported government began to collapse. 
So what did the Soviet Union do? They sent in troops to help the government, or as they said on ABC television while I was trying to watch the game, I believe it was the Eagles. Wasn't the Eagles in a wild card playoff game that Sunday? They ended up going to the Super Bowl that year to get murdered <laughs> by the uh, Raiders. Remember Ron Jaworski throwing all those interceptions? Lester Hayes had to stick them all over him, you know, touching the ball. But anyway, um, Russia has invaded Afghanistan. I watched those tanks going down the mountain pass. I said, ooh, that's bad. Well, they invaded, if you want to say that, on behest of their puppet or Soviet-supported government. They went in there at the request of the Soviet-supported government to back up their failing puppet government. Uh, and so then that war continued, the Americans helping the Mujahideen and the uh, Russians supporting the rebels. But then, you know, Russia, the Soviet Union began to collapse in 1988. So they abandoned the, uh, their, gov their Soviet supported government in 1989. And then the American supported rebels took over in 1992. Only, only problem was they were worse. They were the more radical Muslims. And then they, uh, even back then, some of the, you know, the right wing groups were saying the United States is supporting the wrong side. These guys are bad. They're going to they're more rad. They're you know, they're more uh, dangerous than these goofballs Russia supports. So. Uh, and we know what happened when the Taliban came into power in 96. So you see, there's always a reaction. There's always a, a for every action there's a reaction. You see, you could trace all these things back. But Americans think, oh, it just happened, just like organically. <laughs> like, you know, one day they were rebels. They just showed up for no reason. But it isn't so. And uh, so Syria, we talked about that. Syria, um, Bashar al-Assad trying to hang on in power. And it seems like he's going to now with the Russian help. His father, Hafez al-Assad took over in 1970. Remember, they were not Muslim radicals. They were not Islamists. They were secular, like the United States government, the Syrian government under the Assad family. If you were Catholic or Eastern Orthodox or Muslim or Sunni, you know, Sunni or Shia Muslim or Alawite or, or Druze or um, I think the Druze, isn't that the same as Alawite? Uh, I, I don't, I'm not an expert on these tribes. Um, or religious groups, or whatever group, or maybe you were non-religious. No one was going to bother you, kind of like Saddam Hussein's government. In fact, they would protect Catholics against abuse from Muslims. The, the Saddam Hussein Ba'athist government, the socialist government, and the Syrian Ba'athist socialist government. Well, here they, here they come in like gangbusters taking over Iraq in 2003, and then all the crazy people take over, and now there's all this, they had over a million Catholics in Iraq in 2003 protected by the government christians you say no no saddam he 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 hated christian well, why was the vice president of iraq a catholic if he hated christians see no joe joe five six nine eight four says russia should should be a natural ally of, of ours russia is a natural ally of, of, of ours but the united states does not want to ally herself with natural allies. See, the United States makes enemies of allies. And I don't mean the United States should be allies with Russia in the sense that we should have a form of military alliance. You understand the anti-war position is we don't get involved in military alliances. But I think you, you're you going along with what I'm saying. They should be friends, friends of the United States. We have things in common. Why are we fighting against these people? <laughs> and then you watch these people on TV, on CNN, Fox, whatever. And then going on and on about why Russia's so bad. Well, Russia has a, you know, you hear them talking and they uh, and they never challenge them because I guess the people hosting the show probably don't know much. Of, they should have me on there, right? I'll I'll go on. I'll wear a nicer shirt than this. But that but they don't ask people like me that have a different opinion. They just ask the same old stock people, right? Well, we have Mr. So and So. He's a senior fellow at Columbia University, the uh, center for Let's Go Get Russia Now, uh, founded in 1944. And um, he is, 
and you know, and he'll say, Russia has an authoritarian government and they do many terrible things. They murdered these poor people with poison in London because we know that we do know this because the British intelligence told us so. <laughs> and Russia does all these terrible things. They're not open, they're not democratic. They pick on minorities and we demand that they adopt our form of government because we believe in democracy and everyone should have freedom of choice and self-determination. And if countries will not comply with our dictates, I mean, you know, they, that's what they mean to say. If these countries will not comply with our loving attempts to export our culture to them, then it's only natural that we undermine all of their institutions. And we don't understand why they take offense to these things. You know, and I, mean, I, I always like translate what these people say on CNN into regular English. And that's the cut and dry of it. That's what they really mean. Countries should appreciate us demanding that they adopt our culture. And if they don't, then they have a terrible attitude problem. And sometimes you have to use a little force to help people uh, behave, you see. That's the uh, Washington DC application of fair play. Uh, so it all goes back to uh, 1861, and it all goes back to these New England states. You say, you mean the Yankees? You mean those Yankees? Yeah, like that mentality of, I know what's best for America. We go to respectable congregational churches. My grandfather was a grandmaster of the lodge. <laughs> and those terrible Southern people do not live like we demand they should live. And so we need to use a little force against those wretched folks down in Mississippi and Louisiana and Florida and Virginia. <laughs> oh, well, you know, two or 300,000 American young boys will be killed to put these Southern wretched animals in line. But all in all, we think it's worth it. Now, once we consolidate our sea to shining sea uh, point of light, then we can export all the other points of light around the world and everyone can come under our wonderful Northeastern New York and Washington DC based uh, paradise, you see? Now, wouldn't you love to take that poison? Don't you think you should take that poison? Let's all take that poison. You say, sound like the age of Aquarius or something to me. Yeah, or the age of Horus or the age of Lucifer Sam or something. <laughs> the age of uh, the devil, <laughs> Satan, maybe. But, oh well, why nitpick, you might say to me. Why do you always nitpick? Okay, so what? 600,000 people got killed in the war against the South in 1861 to 65. Okay, a few million people got killed in World War One. Okay, heck, a few million got killed again in World War II. But all in all, when you sit down and look at it, it was really worth it, right? <laughs> Think of all the good that came out of it. Yes. And I think McDonnell Douglas and Boeing would demonstrate a lot of good came out of it and other Cargill, or 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 I uh, should say Monsanto, other company, uh, DuPont, <laughs> DuPont. Oh, watch it, boy! You might wind up being found out by the dumpsters. I, I didn't specifically say anything against those companies. I just said they could demonstrate how uh, a lot of good came out of these these world wars. See, well, 
I know you don't get too popular being anti-war. You're not going to make a big career out of that, I'm afraid. I don't think I'm going to be on CNN talking about all these things from an anti-war viewpoint or Fox or in MSNBC. But here we are on the internet, at least. There are other anti-war voices on the internet. And we're going to keep uh, preaching, I guess you could say, or, or you say, no, you're just a propagandist. You're spreading propaganda. I am spreading propaganda because what is propaganda? It's to it's a promotion of ideas, ideology, right? A television commercial is propaganda. Uh, uh, anytime you try to spread your beliefs, that's propaganda. Everyone who's trying to spread beliefs is a propagandist. We are just trying to propagate anti-war sentiment, okay? I don't have a guilty conscience trying to promote peace in the world. I would have a guilty conscience trying to promote an empire or war or these types of things. Oh, I bet it's going to be pretty interesting in, in about a year. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Two years. Yes, two years when we start talking about the events in Japan in August 1945. I'll be very curious to see how people are going to get on the Internet and try to defend that. They're going to say, no, you don't understand. Sometimes you got to you. Sometimes you have to attack civilians. With a ruthless ferocity and maybe you kill 60 or 70,000, but it's necessary at times. You say that sounds like Joseph Goebbels. Or David Brinkley. Um, well, or any American history book that you ever read. Right. That's what they say. Sometimes you got to attack civilians in, uh, in Japan in, in August 1945 to, to help the world out. OK, well, so that's the cut and dry of it. What should America's position be in Syria? You just heard me. There shouldn't be there should not be a position neutrality. So we ended. We're going to end this. We mean it myself, but the whole anti-war world. We're going to end this by saying neutrality today, neutrality tomorrow, and neutrality forever. That's what we promote. That's what we stand for. And we're entirely serious about that.